Okay, well, I want to welcome uh, everyone to today's presentation, uh, which is Canada Senate Reforms, Independence, and How the Work Gets Done. My name is Doug Mowen, and in addition to being the Director of Executive Education here at uh, Johnson Shama, I'm uh, the moderator for today's event. The Johnson Shama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and administration. And we're a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines our province. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS's physical home is located on, on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories and the traditional homeland of the Métis. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event and feel free to turn your videos back on during the, the Q&A. The format for today's event is as follows. Our speaker will present for approximately 30 minutes. Following the presentation, our uh, speaker will then entertain questions. If you would like to ask a question, uh, please use the Zoom's chat function to send your question to me and uh, I'll either read it out or I'll ask you to ask it yourself. Um, if you have any logistical questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge uh, via the chat functioning, and uh, you'll see Karen's uh, photo uh, in, as one of the uh, in the in the presentation of speakers at the top. Please note that as with all our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS web website at a later date. So now it's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, the Honorable Brent Cotter, QC, is uh, a member of the Senate of Canada. He was appointed uh, to that position in January of 2020. He's one of Canada's foremost legal ethicists with extensive experience in public service and the law. He's a former dean of the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan and one of the original professors and writers in the field of legal ethics in Canada. He's a member of the Law Society of Saskatchewan and the Nova, Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Prior to pursuing his academic career in Saskatchewan, uh, Brent served as the province's Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General. He also served as Saskatchewan's Deputy Minister of Intergovernmental and Aboriginal Affairs. And he's a founding member of the Canadian Association for Legal Ethics, and he sits on various boards, including an advisory board to Inclusion Saskatchewan and the Canadian Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. He served in the pre as the President of the Council of Canadian Law Deans, as well as a member of the Saskatchewan Literacy Foundation, Inclusion Saskatchewan, and as the University Funding Chair for the United Way. Uh, Mr. Cotter holds a Bachelor of Commerce and Marketing from the University of Saskatchewan, as well as a Bachelor of Laws and a Master of Laws from Dalhousie University. Brent is currently a member of the Standing Co Senate Committee on National Security and the Standing Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. So we're looking forward to a great discussion today. Brent, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for the overly generous introduction. Um, it does read like a guy who can't really hold a job. Uh, in any event, I'm pleased to be here and uh, pleased to have a chance to chat with all of you who are uh, in the session. Um, I'd like it to be as uh, valuable and useful for you as possible, and so I'm going to try my best to stay within the 30-minute time frame for my remarks so that there can be a rich opportunity for a dialogue, your comments and questions, I would welcome them. There'll be a learning experience for me as well. Um, I, uh, just uh, two preliminary comments, one in relation to the title. Um, I was just observing not so much the total title of the session, but the phrase, how things get done in the Senate. And quite frankly, I, I'm not entirely sure that I know the answers to that. So if some of you have insights, I would welcome them as well. I'll do my best on that. And just a word or two about myself. I'm, um, as uh, Doug mentioned, I was appointed to the Senate in uh, January. Um, I'm the most junior senator in the Senate. I would put myself in the category of somebody with progressive inclinations, but no political party affiliation. And uh, in light of the fact that I'm 70 years old, my tenure in the Senate will be limited to essentially five years. Um, a number of my colleagues remind me that I'm going to be there so short a time, I won't be eligible for the Senate pension. Uh, I knew that, and in some ways, I feel uh, freed up by that. 
Uh, I should also observe that the Prime Minister has made no appointments into any of the 10 or so vacancies in the Senate uh, since I was appointed in January, which maybe has meant that he is he's having some sober second thought about the bad appointments he's made recently and has to um, recalibrate the appointments. So anyway, um, I have a short tenure and I hope I can make some achievements while I'm there, but I, I don't think I will achieve the level of distinction of many senators who've served in the Senate uh, and for much longer periods of time. So let me begin with a few of the basics. And I've got this uh, talk kind of divided up into three parts going forward. One is what I will call the role of the Senate, some of the basics concerning the Senate. Some of this will be extremely well known to some of you, but perhaps a little bit less known to some others. Uh, secondly, I'll talk a little bit about what I will call the new Senate or the evolving Senate since 2014 when uh, the present government under Mr. Trudeau moved to a new appointment process and some reconfiguration of the Senate. And then fourthly, and briefly a little bit about uh, what the future holds or might hold uh, for the Senate. So as many of you will know, uh, all of the members of the Senate are appointed. They're appointed by the governor and council, essentially, that means the prime minister. Um, the fact that they are appointed makes some meaningful statements about the nature of the authority of senators in the Senate. Senators uh, serve until they either resign from the Senate or are kicked out, which has never actually happened, or they retire at the age of 75. Um, and so no senators can serve past the age of 75. They can serve though as long as they uh, are in the Senate in good, uh, sort of on, on good behavior, so to speak. And many senators have served and some presently there will serve for as many as uh, 30 to 35 years. Most of the senators are tend to be in their uh, 60s or appointed in and around the, the age of 50s and 60s. Because of this appointment authority and not being an elected body, there are certain limits on the Senate's authority, both I think legally and constitutionally on the one hand and maybe by convention on the other. Um, the authority, as you probably know, is that we can reject or amend legislation that comes from the House of Commons, um, but the House of Commons ultimately has the ability to override those qualifiers by the Senate and bring uh, matters into law. Um, I'll say a little bit more about uh, what might be the uh, limits on the exercise of the Senate's authority in a slightly more uh, detailed way uh, in a few minutes time, something that um, I think these days, even more than in the past, senators are wrestling with in terms of the boundaries of their authority. Also, the Senate was initially conceived of as a, something of a regional counterweight to the electoral politics of Canada. Uh, that is to try to provide um, representation in the second house in parliament that could be uh, something of a counterbalance to electoral influences. As you probably know, though, as provinces came into uh, confederation at different times, the distribution of Senate seats was not quite as well balanced geographically as one might hope for, and efforts to address that have often been uh, conflictual. As well, um, to some extent, the Senate has then co been contemplated as a place from which regional voices can advance the interests of Canadians. Um, I remember working for a premier in the past who had some doubt about the effectiveness of that and indeed thought that as a premier of a province, uh, he, his voice represented that of the equivalent in the US of a governor plus two senators, the argument being that the regional voice was overtaken by uh, uh, partisan politics. And also the Senate sometimes has been thought to be a, a place from which uh, the voices of of excluded Canadians might best be heard. And to some extent, I think that has been true in the past. It is noticeably true in the present um, version of the Senate. And I'll mention that in a minute or two as well. It's also been described as a, a institute of so-called sober second thought. I'm not a big fan of the phrase. I did some reading and it's said to have been uh, initiated by uh, Prime Minister John A. MacDonald um, and some think it was a reference to the ancient Greeks who um, deliberated one day drunk and then sober the next. Um, uh, Prime Minister Macdonald was known to take a drink, so it could well be that the reference to sober second thought was actually a literal reference. I'm inclined to think of it in a deliberative way, but 
a little less connected to the drinking side. I think it's also the case that it has not been particularly regional in its uh, effectiveness in advocacy on behalf of regions or provinces. Um, as I say, I think this was, is driven by historically its partisan nature, not been particularly committed to advancing excluded interests, and has been largely a partisan reflection of the House of Commons. I apologize for that. I'm in a hotel room and someone's phoning me. I have to ignore it. Um, in the sense that there are uh, have been historically caucuses in the Senate, that is the government and opposition caucus, and a, a good deal of, of uh, let me call it towing the party line that gets reproduced in the Senate, particularly when it comes to legislation, both advanced by the government and then the government in the Senate, and opposed often by the opposition and the opposition in the Senate. That's been the shape of things until 2014. Uh, Mr. Trudeau in that election ran on a platform, one aspect of which included an intention to modernize the Senate around uh, the issue of uh, caucuses, political caucuses and appointments and to move to a more independent Senate and more independent senators. So one step that occurred, uh, I think to the dismay of some liberal senators was that they were thenceforth, uh, as this new regime was implemented, excluded from the liberal caucus of parliamentarians, so that the Liberal caucus now in Ottawa is limited to members of parliament. And Liberal senators are still senators and probably with a Liberal inclination and many with Liberal affiliations, but are no longer part of a caucus in the parliament. So that's a, a, the first uh, feature of this change. Uh, the second and I think more significant change is a move to a different or independent appointment process. Um, the appointment process now is that you apply for a vacancy in the Senate uh, from your province or from the territory, if that's where the vacancy is. You submit an application, you cobble together references. It's a bit like applying for a job. And that set of applications goes to a, an independent uh, advisory committee on Senate appointments of five people, three appointed by the federal government, and for each province, two more people appointed on recommendations from the province. So panel of five, for every vacancy, they uh, produce a short list of five candidates and forward it to the prime minister who has made a commitment to appoint from the short list that he receives from that independent committee. And that then leads to the filling of a vacancy. I think if you apply your application is good for a couple of years, you don't have to sit and wait until a vacancy pops up. Presently, there are, uh, I think as many as 10 or 12 vacancies, maybe 12 now, uh, two from Saskatchewan. So if you're interested, if this, if this talk inspires you to become a senator, there are two vacancies that you could apply for like right away. And the choices have, have tended to then be uh, not exclusively uh, nonpartisan, but significantly, significantly more so. And if one looks at the uh, 40 or 50 senators who have been appointed under this more uh, independent, more modernized regime, you do see a different, more independent breed of senator and um, an amazing array of talent in the Senate. Let me just mention a few of the people who have been appointed in the last five years. Peter Harder, uh, one of the can Canada's most distinguished deputy ministers in various portfolios for the last 25 years. He served initially as the government leader in the Senate, very effectively in this new and somewhat complicated version of the Senate. Uh, Sebi Marwa, Chief Operating Officer of the Bank of Nova Scotia, basically ran the bank for a period of time. Howard Wetson, uh, former chair of the Ontario Securities Commission, former federal court judge, uh, former head of the Competition Bureau in Ottawa. Raymond Saint-Germain, she was the ombudsperson for Quebec. Paul Wu, a distinguished international business person from Vancouver. Kim Pate, uh, former uh, executive director of Elizabeth Fry Societies of Canada and a champion of the rights of people incarcerated. Stan Kutcher, a distinguished psychiatrist from Nova Scotia. Peter Beam, uh, a deputy minister of foreign affairs and the prime minister Sherpa in uh, the most recent round of G7 uh, activity. Tony Dean, former clerk or deputy minister to the premier of Ontario. Chantal Petitclair, a uh, Paralympian gold medalist. Marie Sinclair, a former judge, uh, chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a commissioner, um, Marty Klein, distinguished Indigenous business person from uh, Saskatchewan, um, Pierre Delphon, former judge of the uh, Quebec Court of Appeal. The list is quite remarkable, really. 
And I've overlooked many people, particularly from the arts, who have really made outstanding contributions or from the immigration community or indigenous community, a significant number of indigenous centers, senators appointed Mary Jane McCallum, a, a dentist uh, who sits right in front of me in the Senate from Manitoba. It's, it's a, an impressive list. What it is as well is a list of senators who have, by virtue of a careers in areas where they have uh, achieved distinction, often come with what I will call causes. They champion perspectives that present themselves in unusual ways compared to, I think, how the Senate has worked in the past. One of the things as well is that uh, th this group of senators, without a close connection to politics that is in a large P kind of way, and also less familiar with parliamentary and legislative processes than perhaps the former more partisan kinds of appointments that were made, um, are challenged a little bit in the way in which we actually do try to get things done in the Senate. It, there, there is a good deal less cohesiveness that this, um, this wider range and wider range of diversity, the kind of thousand points of light shining, they don't always shine in a really focused way when it comes to getting the business done. This is my early impression, uh, tempered a little bit by the fact that it has been a COVID year everywhere, including in the Senate. Let me just say a little bit about how the senators are organized presently and some of the ways in which that has implications for their work. Um, historically, a government and an opposition uh, caucus, uh, usually liberals, uh, liberals and conservatives, and, and they changed seats from time to time, depending on the makeup in the Senate and who was the governing party in the House of Commons. Um, but with this more recent development, that, that has gone through a... a a sea change in a significant way. The Conservatives have continued to function as a political party and a caucus. Uh, so their members now in the mid twenties um, are the only political party, the only party in, in the Senate now. The other, the rest of the senators about another 75 or so are divided up essentially into three groups. There is an independent senators group. I'm a member of that group. It is about half the members of the Senate. I think we're 48 or thereabouts numbers right now. There's another group of what are called Canadian Senators Group. Doug referenced them as well. The Canadian Senators Group is a smaller group of uh, maybe a dozen or 15 senators, mostly com comprised of people who, are, who opted to leave the Conservative Caucus or were liberals who uh, weren't all that happy not to be liberals anymore and coalesced together in the Canadian Senators Group. It's led by a fellow by the name of Scott Tannis. Uh, one of the uh, Saskatchewan Senators, Pam Wallen, is part of that group. There is a fourth group, uh, relatively recently formed, the Progressive Senators Group, which is a group of people who have, some of them been in the Independent Senators Group and have left recently, and some who were appointed to the, to the Senate as Liberals weren't liberals for a period of time and that weren't, haven't been liberals for a period of time because of that, at least officially, and have coalesced together in this progressive senators group led by a uh, senator from Nova Scotia by the name of Jane Cordy. The group that I'm in is led by two facilitators, which seems to be what you call the leaders of groups these days, uh, Pa Wu from British Columbia and Raymond Saint-Germain uh, from Quebec. Um, so that's a, that's a significant change and each of those groups functions in a somewhat cohesive but somewhat independent way depending on the issue and how they operate. The implications for the operation of the Senate are that there's far more uh, or far less predictability with respect to how legislation will be treated. So there are no caucuses except the conservatives. There are no whips meaning that in those independent groups, in the independent group or the uh, Canadian Senators Group or Progressive Senators Group, nobody is being ordered to vote in a certain way. So independence tends to pervade those three other groups. Um, sometimes the focus from those groups or individuals in those groups can be on what might be called tangential aspects of legislation that are of particular interest to a particular senator. That would not have happened in a caucus uh, Senate uh, with, uh, with whipping and expectations, I think. I think as a result, though, with the majority of senators being independent, there is less of a guarantee that senators will naturally support government initiatives. I think it's fair to say that most of the people who have been appointed 
since Mr. Trudeau implemented this more independent appointment process have been on the progressive side of the equation. Um, many significant business leaders, uh, but who I think have a progressive orientation to the way in which government can uh, kind of strengthen our society. But the, uh, the level of confidence that the Prime Minister or the House of Commons can have that the Senate will embrace government initiatives is uh, certainly subject to question. We are in the process right now of examining um, Bill C-7, which is an amendment, a uh, set of amendments to the criminal code to deal with uh, adjustments to the medical assistance in dying uh, framework. And um, the, uh, the question of whether or not that legislation will be adopted in the Senate, say unamended, is a very much an open question. And without being able to even say necessarily who has what views, even within a relatively progressive independent senators group, there are going to be very noticeable differences in points of view on aspects of that legislation. So what you tend to get is this um, the vibrant uh, operation, but it's less predictable in terms of moving forward um, either the government agenda or any political agenda at all. It's also, I think, generating slightly more unpredictable lines of inquiry that the Senate undertakes. The second aspect of the job, other than considering legislation and sometimes introducing and initiating legislation, is this other work around inquiries and reports and studies that the Senate does. And historically, for people who have been interested in the topic, the Senate has really done excellent work on a wide range of big questions that are societal, that may uh, outlast any particular term of a government. It's one of the advantages of an appointed Senate is that you can stay the course and not worry too much about electoral wins from one time to another and actually develop imaginative uh, long-range work on whether it's health care or criminal matters or uh, all kinds of social dimensions of our society. Work on banking, for example, is underway and the Senate is actually doing leadership work there. It's really, I think, in that respect, quite remarkable. This shaping of the Senate, I think, will end up creating some unpredictable lines of inquiry that senators will want to pursue um, outside the consideration of legislation. Let me uh, also turn, if I may, to this point about that I mentioned before about what are the boundaries of independence in senatorial decision making on as uh, much as anything in, in individual basis. I think it goes without saying that senators have to be resistant to anything that they come to the conclusion uh, would be an initiative that would be illegal, but that's pretty rare. The more difficult questions I think arise in these two contexts. If you're a Senator and you come to the view that a piece of legislation is, is seriously in your judgment, a, a violation of the constitutionality of Canada, that is probably a violation of the Charter of Rights and not able to be saved by the Reasonable Limits Clause, Section 1, do you have an obligation to resist that legislation or the portion of that legislation that you can have concluded is unconstitutional? Do you owe a greater fidelity to the Constitution than to, let's say, the legislative process to get legislation through? So one of the places where that's arising now is this point about whether mental illness is a sole underlying condition. I choose this as the most recent example. Sole underlying condition for access to medical assistance in dying is excluded. Is that a violation of the charter rights of people with mental illness who wouldn't like to access the main regime? And if that's the case, does a senator who comes to that view have a kind of obligation, and in the context of being freed up from partisan politics, a greater ability to advance that obligation to resist the adoption of such, let me call it unconstitutional legislation? So a first big question, probably always been a question, but it is a more, uh, it's, it's freer to consider when it's not constrained by the questions of allegiance to political parties and, and the, uh, the agenda of the government, let's say. A second is, if you're making decisions in relation to um, political and policy initiatives of the government with which you may be in disagreement, maybe profound disagreement, keeping in mind that senators are appointed, not elected. They are therefore not directly accountable uh, to the citizenry of Canada, except in the sense within their own thought framework. So take the example of um, 
a, def a question of deference here. Take the example of a political party that has advanced a proposition or initiative X in its electoral platform. And the people have voted that party into government, not exclusively, but perhaps in part on their desire to, to initiate and implement Proposition X. And the government puts Proposition X together in a piece of legislation. And you are a senator who is profoundly opposed to the idea of Proposition X. As, a, uh, as an appointed senator, it seems to me that you need to be extremely cautious about advancing your own personal position, let's say, maybe highly informed, but still personal, in conflict with an agenda of the government that appears to have been electorally endorsed by the citizens. It seems to me if one advances their own personal circumstances and position there, uh, they are really pressing hard against the democratic nature of the country. Now, if it just happens to be an initiative that you think is a bad idea, that doesn't have quite the same electoral blessing, but is still advanced by the government that was chosen by the people to run the government, the country for a period of time, in those circumstances, do you have a little bit more leeway to advance a profoundly held view of your own? Let's say that this is bad. This is a bad initiative and the people weren't directly consulted, let's say, with respect to it. I'm not so sure on that, but I think it's at least an open and and worthwhile question to consider and much more open to be considered in this less partisan, more independent structure of a Senate. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, uh, what I uh, would describe as impediments to a fully reformed Senate, and then just a few words about what the future might hold, and then we'll throw it open for questions. Um, impediments to the Senate in any context have been uh, have existed with the, the appearance of the coronavirus and COVID-19 has very much complicated and uh, undercut the work of the Senate. I can't tell you how great or not so great an institution it is, um, but certainly the COVID uh, challenge for, um, as it has been in much greater uh, potency for other Canadians has also affected the operation of the Senate. We didn't sit very much in the spring or early summer. We're called back on an emergency basis to pass the uh, emergency bills that got, got money out to, to tenants and got money out to businesses, got money out to employees, and students and the like. Um, and uh, by and large, that was about the only business the Senate did in the spring. And we have struggled with the process. It's had its own kind of inside baseball complications in the Senate to be able to move to virtual or hybrid uh, sittings of the Senate or its committees. And we only just in the last um, month or so gotten that sorted out in order to move forward. We have been slower than the House of Commons and most of the other developed countries in finding ways to move ourselves forward. Um, uh, secondly, um, although I have mentioned the changes to who gets to be senators now and a little bit about how if you were a liberal senator, you aren't a liberal anymore, you're, though you're still a senator, there continue to be some other um, uh, complications, I think, to, a, to the smooth functioning and, and identity of a more reformed and modernized Senate. One is that although their numbers are small, the official opposition and the authority of the official, official opposition in the Senate is still significant and um, structurally, I guess, legitimate, but disproportionate to their numbers in the Senate. And, uh, and as a corollary of that, these other groups, even though they are actually larger in, in numbers, are not as fully recognized under the Parliament of Canada legislation or the rules that operate the Senate. There is also, in my view, a quite slow progress in modernizing the ethical standards for senators. And the Senate has been um, bedeviled or maybe even rocked by issues of, of ethics with respect to individual senators. Um, and the Senate has taken some steps to do that to make senators more accountable and the Senate itself more accountable but we are not there yet and uh, meaningful additional work needs to be done in order to begin to build public confidence in the Senate to a greater degree than exists presently. And then there are, I think, some curious constraints on the operation of an independent Senate. And, and I have found the, the ways in which the Senate operates to be uh, antiquated, uh, uh, to say the least, and not very efficient. Hopefully, sometime in the future, we'll find models of work that are a bit more efficient and effective 
um, but that doesn't exist presently. And I, I was completely taken by surprise by that. But the other, that's a small example of, an in, uh, of independence, is that if you watch in the House of Commons at the beginning of each session after, say, a government has been elected, all the members of the House of Commons, all the members of Parliament vote on who they want to be the Speaker of the House of Commons, and that person becomes the Speaker. In the Senate, you might think, well, the same thing would happen. But in fact, by virtue of a provision of the Constitution Act of Canada, the Prime Minister appoints the Speaker of the Senate. Now, I would have thought that Mr. Trudeau, perhaps through some form of convention or protocol, would have given up that responsibility. And it's relatively easy to do if he does the same thing he does with respect to the appointment of senators, which is to say, I'll undertake to be bound by who the Senate recommends for speaker, in which case the Senate could vote, choose their own speaker. The present speaker, George Fury, is an honorable guy from Newfoundland, does I think a very good job as the speaker. So it's not really about Mr. Fury at all. And I'm so new that I don't really know the degree to which the speaker has power or not. But one would have thought that the official arbiter of the operation of the speaker uh, role of the Senate uh, should be chosen by the senators and not the prime minister. So there's a small example of at least a, a piece of reform that's left to be done. I think there are a number of other features that will get worked on in the coming years if the model proceeds as it is. So this is two really two relatively small references to the future of the Senate. If the Liberals stay in power for a period of time going forward, my anticipation is that they will continue down this road of appointing independent senators and probably becoming flexible on some of the other indicia of an independent Senate. It would lead in that route to most senators being in a certain way independent. Uh, the Conservative caucus will decline, it will shrink and the bipolar way of operating to the extent that it exists, and noticeably in the Senate it does, this bipolar offer, way of operating between government and opposition will drift away and new ways of operating will evolve. These are unclear. I myself think the Senate is in, in its present state is searching for its new identity and hasn't found it yet. I'd be interested in your views about what that identity could or should be. I think it's possible that new groups will form based on a consolidation of interest, which might stabilize the Senate a little bit, but there will continue to be a significant degree of independence asserted by senators, present and, and future ones. I think good people will apply or continue to apply, and hopefully the prime minister gets to choose some new senators after he's gotten over his disappointment, his appointment to me. Um, but I also think the prime minister will need to be a bit more careful about the selection of senators to ensure that they're uh, a, from a pool of talent that is great, but also that will see their need and part of the responsibility be, to be committed to moving the agenda of government forward, even as senators exercise a degree of independence in that process. If the Conservatives are re-elected to power in the relatively near future, my understanding is that they would likely return to the more traditional pattern of the Senate, including more partisan-based appointments. That was Mr. Scheer's position, as I understand it, in the last federal election. This would preserve or revive or enrich the partisan kind of government opposition approach to the Senate in the Senate that has occurred in the past and would in some ways be rep replicative of what happens in the House of Commons. It would return to a party alignment in Senate decision-making, at least with respect to the Conservatives. So I don't necessarily, I don't think the Conservatives, excuse me, <coughs> have the ability to make other folks join political parties. So it's a bit hard to know what the remaining crowd would look like in the model of a sort of a government opposition uh, set up in the Senate going forward. I don't think it, what I've just described is, would all be bad. But I think it would limit the potential of, for the Senate to bring new people and new ideas and representation of new voices into the Senate and into the political sphere in ways that electoral politics does not. And a return to uh, partisan shaping of the Senate would cause a fair number of people who might otherwise have been interested to contribute to uh, in the public sphere in this way to be disinclined to do so. And we would... Um, we would lose, I think, this trend to talented people joining the Senate and making their contributions. 
let me stop there and uh, invite your questions and comments and critiques uh, and help me learn a little bit about how the Senate could get things done a little better. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. That was really interesting. I really appreciate the, uh, the insights. Um, I, uh, I think um, we, uh, we, we'll go to uh, questions now. And so um, do, if anybody has a question, Feel, please feel free to ask it. Um, I, I, I think there's a couple of ways of doing that. First of all, you could put your question on chat uh, if you don't want to ask the question yourself and I can read it. Or if you want to ask a question, just let me know that you've got one. Uh, feel free to turn your cameras on now if you're inclined to, so that uh, we can see you as you ask, ask the question. Um, but uh, we, we certainly welcome any questions. So I'm just going to stop for a moment so I don't talk over you and uh, and uh, please put questions to, to our speaker. Well, I'm going to ask a question, Brent. Um, sure. I, uh, you know, I, I am curious as to, you know, if you're developing a sense of what the government wants to accomplish uh, with the Senate, um, you know, it, it uh, you know, obviously went down this road, uh, obviously wants to see more independence, but do, do you, you know, is there kind of a bigger ag agenda here in terms of, what the government might be wanting to accomplish with these rather significant changes? And are there, you know, and are, are they seeing unintended consequences that they perhaps didn't expect? Well, I haven't uh, done the calculation, Doug, but I'm, I'm told that in this new version of the Senate, significantly more bills or portions of bills are being amended by the Senate and sent back. And uh, to the credit of the government, I think they have been accepting some of those amendments. Uh, certainly not a majority and certainly not all uh, whether if you're the you know the prime minister or the minister of some particular portfolio and the senate keeps changing your legislation whether you say gee that's a good thing that actually is improving things or it's just a pain and is getting the way of government in, uh, in the way of government i don't really know i think there is a, an inclination to the latter which is we think we're doing a good job give it our blessing but there's also a degree of i guess i would call it um uh, respect that's being shown in this exercise. And I think, you know, that's, that's to be encouraged and applauded. But I, I, I don't think there is a big strategy. What I do think happens now is that new, um, new lines of communication have to have been developed in a caucus shape of government. Uh, the, you know, the, the Minister of Justice, let's say, who um, is interested in um, in moving certain legislation through the Senate, as he would be, or, or who, say it's his or her legislation, um, taps into one of the government member senators in the government caucus in the Senate and gets that person to lead and sponsor a bill. And now what happens is with no such members in the Senate, new lines of communication and new requests for leadership have to be developed and they tend to be developed on on one-off initiatives rather than here's the package, who wants to support which pieces of it when it comes to the Senate floor kind of thing. So what has resulted is that, for example, in the, in the medical assistance and dying legislation, the government has reached out to Senator Petticler, who herself is paraplegic and, uh, and uh, Paralympian, as I mentioned, to be the, lead, the government sponsor for that bill in the Senate. Well, she's not a liberal. In the old days, it would have been some liberal member of the caucus. So the government has had to find different ways of, let me call it, having the Senate lead its work and also uh, sort of guide it towards success. And I expect that I'm going to be reached out to sponsor a bill or two. Um, you, you don't really want to sponsor ones except if you're sympathetic to them. But that having been said, it's a, it's a different way of working. So one day you might get a phone call from the Minister of Justice who you haven't, don't know or haven't ever heard of much. Um, in my case, I know Minister Lametti from a previous movie, but um, to actually help, help move the government's agenda forward on this topic. But it, it starts to become a bit atomized and as opposed to the overall structure of you're the liberal senators who advance the government's agenda or you were the liberal or the conservative senators who advance the government's agenda. It now has to be done in much more individualized and atomized ways. In fact, it can't even be group ways. Like the, we're half the Senate in this independent senators group. The prime minister can't phone up uh, Senator Wu and say, 
get all the independent senators to vote for this bill because the leader of the independent senators group is, I mean, genuinely just a facilitator, but not a whip cracker, so to speak. Thanks, Brent. I'm, uh, Bob's got a question, but I can, I think, put his first, then I'll go to yeah. Bob, okay. and then I'll go to Dale Eisler. Yeah, uh, Brent, I, I'm, I mean, I'm intrigued by this, partly, I mean, maybe I just didn't think that much about it, but this, this idea of the ethical questions about do we, if we're opposed to this bill, do we vote against it? Or, uh, you know, if it was part of the party platform and they, they got elected by, by, you know, making the commitment to push it forward, do you simply look at it for, well, I'm adding in now, do you look at this based on the, the technical aspect of the bill and maybe make comments about that, but in the big picture, step back and say, even though I, I don't agree, I'll, I'll, I'll support it. I, you know, we got a crazy, well, it's not crazy. Our democracy will see a government in power that doesn't have 50%, not of the vote, not even that right. that maybe is the perfect number. But so just talk a little bit more about that. I just. Sure. I, um, I hadn't thought about this at all before I came to the Senate. And so I, the, and these conversations tend to occur uh, over a coffee and there's a senator's lounge and you get to sit and chat with some of the senators who you respect and who have a, a good deal more experience. And so I have been interested in exploring that question about what are the, how does, um, how does an electoral democracy make a statement to the boundaries of senators work? And um, so I'm wrestling a little bit with that. What, the, what I'm learning, and, and we're seeing this more clearly this fall as we actually look at and make decisions on legislation other than the, the big emergency legislation of the spring and summer is that the Senate tends to do uh, two or three things. Uh, one of them is that it will develop amendments to legislation with a view to making it better. And implicitly, I think when senators vote in favor of those amendments, they are saying what came to us wasn't good enough and we're making a, a legislative statement that it can be made better in a certain way. And I'm guessing that that will happen. Uh, and that's, that's what this larger batch of amendments seems to be over the last four or five years. Secondly, what the Senate often does is produce a report that also makes observations. So I think it's, it's almost like uh, we aren't going to assert what we are going to call a legislative authority. And maybe it's because, geez, we're appointed. Uh, there's a limit to our authority and our rights. But we do want to make a statement. We think you've overlooked this, or you you shouldn't adopt this until you've gone out and consulted with Indigenous communities or whatever it happens to be. So it looks to me a bit like the Senate has a few uh, levels of message, if, if, if I can call it that, and they can be nuanced in some ways by the, the, the certainty with which senators are troubled by legislation or the uncertainty and therefore respect for the electoral process. So I'm, I'm kind of learning as, as I go here, but I'm sharing with you what I've basically kind of been trying to distill the good and bad views that I'm learning from my colleagues. And this is the shape I'm at so far. Great. Thank, thanks for that. Okay. Good question, though. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Bob Hawkins. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Brent, for a very uh, coherent uh, view of the Senate. My thanks, question Bob. is a little along the lines of Ken's question. I'm worried about the power of the House of Commons. Uh, we have a Supreme Court who's unelected, empowered by a charter, particularly Section 715, Section 1. Um, we have now a Senate which purports to gain some legitimacy by being independent. At some point, do we have to start to worry about whether the democracy of the country is threatened, whether uh, House of Commons voice is being properly heard, whether the views of constituencies across the country is being reflected anywhere. I'm wondering if the danger here in making the Senate more powerful is that the power of the House of Commons is in reality the elected body, but is in reality uh, diminished even further. Well, the question of the authority of the Supreme Court is um, kind of a little beyond my remit on this. Um, but I, I, uh, I think I get your point about the, uh, the Senate. I don't think that we get, uh, by virtue of this model of the Senate, I don't think we actually get more power, but I do think we're going to see some senators, to be honest about this, 
some senators exercise their independent viewpoints in ways that I don't want to say are bizarre, but are certainly unpredictable. And they will uh, have the potential to get in the way of the smooth functioning of the House of Commons as the electoral body that you and I chose, right? So I, I, I have been um, anxious about that. Uh, and to, if I could be, um, I don't, this is now me interpreting the motives of the prime minister and appointing me and the woman from New Brunswick who was appointed at the same time in January. You know, we, are, we are capable and I think deserving of being appointed, but we are not kind of superstars in the constellation of psychiatrists or business leaders the way some of these other folks are. But uh, Senator Keating and I have a, a, a good understanding of how a, the electoral process works and, and what it says and how the machinery of government moves things through in respectable ways. And I don't think I was trying to flatter myself by saying the prime minister will have to be more careful in his selection of senators if he continues to be prime minister. But I do think he'll have to be attentive to getting people who are who have good quality and are good people, but also understand the limits of their, uh, not solely the authority of senators, but the limits of their authority, because I don't think we have the power to blow up the democracy, but we have a, a way of uh, interfering with uh, it being conducted in honorable ways that most Canadians expect. So we, I, I think we have to be principled, but we have to be respectful that we are, we are really given a limited voice here and we should exercise it well, but not think that somehow we've been made emperors of Canada. Thank you. I liked your idea about the levels of response that may be available to senators. I think that's useful. I appreciate it. It's, it's tricky. If I can, I can say, say this, Bob, it's, it's tricky for uh, a collection of independent senators to coalesce around what are the right ways of doing our job. I think that's, uh, that's that search for a new identity in this environment. And you know, I, I, I started to see that early on. I wish we could have uh, made more progress on that through the spring and summer. It's just, it just was, wasn't even really possible to get together. But that's, I think, an important uh, role for us to do. And, and, you know, some people might say, well, you're just trying to figure out how to do your business a little bit better. But it has the potential to make the big kind of statements, good or bad, that you yourself um, uh, spoke to. Okay, now I'll go to Dale Eisler, then I'll go to Anastasia, and then to Jane. Um, so, Dale. Good, thanks. Uh, is my sound working okay? It's fine, yep. Yeah, hi, hi Brent, how are you? This nice is uh, you. kind of following on, on uh, Bob and Ken's kind of theme, but I'm wondering, you know, we live in this, uh, this current environment of populism, I think it's fair to say, in, uh, that's happening in many parts of the world. Uh, to a lesser extent in Canada, but you never know. And, but, in, but in that reality, I'm wondering, um, and if there's any kind of research on this, about um, whether Canadians believe that the Senate has the moral authority to be a legitimate institution of governance. That, uh, like, uh, all institutions sort of uh, take their credibility from public support. And um, while I'm personally a big believer in the Senate, and the whole notion of, uh, of sober second thought, I think it's, it's actually critical in that the democratic will is being fairly represented in the House of Commons. And there's, no, there's no shortage of that. And so the, having an institution that can kind of uh, draw back from the whims of public opinion and judge issues, uh, you know, in, in that kind of environment is good. But I don't know about Canadians. And Brent, if you have any sense of, of sort of the moral authority of, of, of the Senate in Canada amongst Canadians. Uh, do you think it has what it needs to be an effective institution? Uh, let me offer two thoughts on that. Um, aside from the fact that I thought you would probably make a better Senator than me, me Dale. Um, so, my, so that was my first thought. My, second, my other two thoughts are, I think, um, when Mr. Harper posed a set of questions to the Supreme Court of Canada regarding the existence and shape of the Senate, he got a constitutional message back. And the question probably, uh, if the question you know, was around getting rid of the Senate and all the rest of it, there might've been a significant number of Canadians who were uh, sympathetic to that point of view. I, I, when I got appointed, I got a letter from Lauren Calvert, former Premier of Saskatchewan who wrote and said, 
congratulations on being appointed to the Senate. I guess I have to tear up all my speeches calling for its abolition. Well, I probably was closer to the world of abolition in that previous uh, regime than in the past, and I'm sure more so than you. But the Supreme Court basically describes a process by which change or the elimination of the Senate would have to take place. And most people have said that will never happen. So we're left with how do we make it as useful an institution as it can be in the circumstances. So, uh, you know, if, if all the people of Canada said, you know, um, the Senate's useless, uh, all that we could do is just stop coming to work, right? To honor that, we just wouldn't show up. And I think that's unlikely. So then the next question is, based on what Canadians tend to say, what's the most useful shape that the Senate can take? What are the in the exercise of such authorities it has, how should it function? And I, uh, one of the people who is a senator was appointed actually by the Conservatives and who has reflected on this uh, question quite a bit said, what are the expectations of Canadians? And I think she drew this from research. I don't know where from, but uh, I'll just read this to you and you'll get the idea of, of what Canadians want at least. If, if you've got to have a Senate, what do you want out of the Senate? Nonpartisan upper house. Now, this was written by a senator who was appointed by a conservative. Independent and responsible senators, an efficient institution, one that's accountable to taxpayers for their expenditures and decisions, and one that's relevant and reflects and investigates Canadian concerns. And you know, those are not um, those are not particularly threatening to democracy. I don't think, subject to what Bob and I were talking about. But I do think they provide a little bit of a template for like, how can you make yourself a reasonably good institution so that whatever level of confidence or lack of confidence people have in the Senate right now, it can be improved a little bit. And I'm, I don't know all of the answers here, but I am in favor particularly. I like the less partisan nature, I think. I like these efficiency goals. And I like the idea of much better kind of financial and ethical accountability. And I think I can be useful on some of those fronts. But that, you know, I, I, um, I accept the point about people not having very much confidence, but if we can't do away from with it, what are some features that can make it a little better or better? And I think this is not a bad list. Thanks, Dale. Uh, so Thanks. Anastasia, do you want to put your question? Uh, or do you need me to read it for you? Where are you? Okay. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll read it, and if you want to add anything, you can. Um, so, uh, what are the key? What's the key reason, Brent, for the Senate's distant meetings being postponed up until November? Was it a technical issue, organizational, or due to security reasons such as the need to build a secured IT platform? Um, the um, I think I would describe it as uh, as two in two or three parts. We were. Um, you know, we came second in the uh, in access to the technology to put in place um, uh, virtual or hybrid meetings. So that was one thing. Uh, and probably our business was except to, to deal with the emergency legislation, not as important as the House of Commons. And uh, secondly, the, one of the uh, strategies I think that has existed in the Senate is, is for the Conservatives to try to hang on to the level of authority that they have. And there, are, um, there were some concerns on the part of the Conservatives that uh, an easier way of functioning with uh, hybrid or, or um, uh, virtual models of the Senate didn't give them as much space to be genuinely oppositional and effective as an opposition if we, uh, as opposed to say the in-person meetings of the Senate. So we couldn't get uh, approval within the Senate to get committees struck and up and operating and we couldn't get approval to move to a um, virtual or hybrid Senate or committees until well into the fall. And what the Senate, as I am understanding it, the Senate tends to structure its business work for some periods following when the House of Commons operates. So as you'll know, for example, the House of Commons shut down for a long period of time until the latter part of September pursuant to prorogation. And once that, ha once prorogation occurred, we had nothing to do. And then even when the House of Commons came back to work, we didn't get called back till after that because we're kind of waiting for the work that they'll send our way. So we were further delayed in getting that up and running. And even now, only some of our committees are able to meet in a hybrid or virtual way. And the present 
dilemmas are uh, all technical or all technological. There's only so much capacity to run this collection of meetings and so we're having to be a good deal more selective. Last week, for example, and I don't know whether these went together, the Senate didn't sit, but the legal and constitutional committee of the Senate sat and we sat eight hours a day for five, five whole days uh, hearing witnesses on the, um, the medical assistance and dying legislation but none of the other committees met. And I think most of them would not have been able to meet because there just wasn't enough technology available for them. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Anastasia. I've got a, then a question from Jane and after Jane, we'll go to Kyle and then Ron. Jane, over to you. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, and first, congratulations on your appointment. It seems to me, uh, the Prime Minister knew what he was doing when you were appointed. I'm, I'm uh, really pleased with the presentation you made this morning. Thanks, Jim. Um, very helpful to have your perspective on that, so thanks. I'm particularly interested in you know, the role of the Senate in looking at legislation. And I wonder how, how really in our society do we balance getting perfect legislation with uh, just making some progress. When we see, you know, just in the context of our world today, if I just put it that broadly, um, you know, there are things that are not going to work unless we make some progress. Um, and I'd like to give you uh, two difficult uh, challenges to <laughs> answer my question in, a, in, sure. in that context. One is um, as we approach December 10th, which is um, Human Rights Day around the world, um, what about the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People? We were so hopeful, we got really close with implementing that. We know it's a hard problem, um, but you know, how, how does the Senate help us to move forward, uh, not hold us back? So the Senate's already looked at that, but what about uh, guaranteed livable income? Another hard problem, really important in the context of where we're at in our world today. Um, please. Sure. Um, I thought you would send me some hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me try and answer them in terms of specifics, Jane, because I think the questions are excellent. Um, I was going to offer a bit smaller one, which gives you a bit of a sense of my own philosophy. The, the Senate is um, going to be considering a bill amending the Judges Act to create a regime where judges would be expected either prior to appointment or once they're appointed to commit to uh, education in the area of sexual assault and, uh, and those kinds of issues. You'd be familiar with that, I think, in, in general terms. And I wrote a, I read the, the bill as it had made its way through the House of Commons and there's a sponsor in the Senate and I met with him, it's Senator uh, Pierre Delfond, and I met with him and I actually wrote out an improved amendment to that bill. Um, and and I, as you were talking, I was thinking about how do, you, how do you manage between sort of the good and the perfect and not having the perfect get, a, get so much in the way of the good that you never even get the good. So I crafted it for him and I sent it to him and, but I'm not gonna live or die on that. Like this is a good idea and you know, I learned from Doug how to do these sorts of things, but I think you need to respect exactly the point that you made. On the two big questions, though, if you take UNDRIP, I think the prospects of constructive consideration of UNDRIP in the Senate are greater now than they were under a more partisan Senate. The Conservatives have the greatest reservations about UNDRIP. It's lots of others, and I need, I need to study a little bit of it myself to satisfy my own reservations, but I think the situation is better for the consideration of UNDRIP now than it, than it would be in a highly partisan Senate. Um, so that's the first. On guaranteed livable income, the, um, that's also the case that there is a good deal more enthusiasm in the Senate than there is in the House of Commons for guaranteed livable income, not completely across the groups and caucuses and political perspectives, but not insignificantly so. And there's, um, there have been a couple of working groups made up of people in a number of the Senate groups that have been examining uh, guaranteed livable income. And we brought in people. I have, um, uh, I don't, don't know that I mentioned this and I think one or two of them are on the line now. I, I decided not to hire kind of a parliamentary researcher, but instead hired 
six law students over the summer to do research for me on various key issues, partly to create jobs. Kareem, you're probably on this call. Um, uh, and uh, because there weren't going to be very many summer jobs for students this year, and I didn't think the government was even doing a good enough job on that front. But the result is that I had two students working specifically on that topic who were, um, uh, you know, participated in the calls, did research, and I have a, a much greater insight than I otherwise would have. If I were, um, let's say, a liberal senator, imagining that, I, I wouldn't be, they would never have chose me, I would have never accepted. But if I had been a liberal senator, there's a good chance that the minister of whoever finance would say, shut down that. I don't, I, I'm not saying that this minister of finance would, but a minister of finance could say, uh, you know, shut down that work on guaranteed livable income. We can't afford it. And that's what the senators would do. They would be shaped and not able to assert a, a value framework that you've just described and that man, many uh, of us hold. So I think this is a better climate for doing meaningful things. Uh, it's not that meaningful things weren't done, but I think there's a good climate for it now. Thanks. That's encouraging. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jane. Kyle, do you want to put your question? Sure. Thanks, Doug. And uh, thanks, Senator Cotter. Um, so given your comments on the antiquated nature of the of Senate procedure, and um, I know that uh, I don't want to overstate things, but um, what steps do you think the Senate can take to be leaders in reforming their kind of their own processes? Um, there are a couple of reform processes underway. Um, they are um, resisted in some quarters because there's often a kind of degree of influence and authority that gets compromised for some. Um, but um, even aside from those questions of, of, of enabling the other Senate groups to be more influential and streamlining work. Let me give you a, a small example of how I interpret the Senate doctrine. Let's say you have a good idea for a piece of legislation to um, amend the criminal code to, um, to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences in some crimes, okay? And you think it's a good idea, so you come forward with a piece of legislation. The way we consider that legislation is that you introduce it and a couple of days later, you give a speech on it for up to 15 minutes. And then, I don't know, um, the following week, you get another senator to give a speech on the same topic. And then maybe seven days later, somebody else gives a speech on the same topic. If you imagined, uh, and I use this parallel, if you imagined that you were Ford Motor Company and you were trying to decide whether you should go entirely to electric cars. Now, admittedly, we're not a a business, but you know, we have decisions to make and you like to think we'd make them in efficient, effective ways. Do you imagine that the board of directors trying to decide on whether to go for uh, electric cars has somebody at the board of directors, one of their vice presidents presents their 15 minute spiel on why electric cars would be a good idea. And then a few weeks later they meet again and somebody else offers a view on electric cars. And we do this one speech every two, three weeks for months before we finally decide on electric cars. If you were a shareholder watching that board of directors meeting at, at Ford Motor Company, and that was the way they did business, you would say, fire them all. Like, this is ridiculous. One day you should be deciding on electric cars in the same way that it seems to me one day we as a Senate should all be talking about amending the criminal code on this in this fashion. But that's like, there are these, in my mind, I see these strings of decision-making going from today out perhaps into infinity on each of any number of topics that we're working on. And other, there are other aspects of work that the Senate does in committees and the like, but the Senate itself has a, has a yesterday's version of how to, how to make decisions. And I just hope we can find ways of uh, overcoming these inefficiencies and what seems to be like, I can't, I can't always remember what somebody said three weeks ago on this particular topic and I shouldn't have to. Anyway, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a efficiency rant and I'm trying to recognize that it's a parliament. It's not an, a, an, it's not executive government run by Doug Moen and it's not uh, uh, General Motors or Ford Motor Company, but we should be able to find way, ways on behalf of Canadians to do our work more effectively uh, for them, I think. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Brent. Uh, Ron, uh, when, I, and when Ron is... 
when Brent a answers Ron's questions, then I don't have any other questions ahead of me. So think about the uh, two or three more questions, folks. We have a little bit of time here. Uh, Ron? Uh, first, I haven't seen you, Brent, since you were, were appointed to the pick, <laughs> but congratulations, okay? Thanks, Ron. Uh, when I first saw it, I, I thought, you know, it was a very good choice. Uh, you know, quite honestly, uh, I, I just think you're a, you're a good person to have there. I, I know the kind of common sense you bring to things. And so again, congratulations. Um, you know, over the years I, I've been around, uh, I've always been, I guess, surprised by the events that happen worldwide in Canada, you know, things like the pandemic that, you know, I probably till it got here, I recognized it was a threat, but, you know, again, once it arrives, you're kind of surprised by these sort of things. Um, but over that period of time, one of my sort of unassailable beliefs is that uh, our, our democracy here in Canada and, and probably in, in most of the developed world, okay, is strong enough to, uh, to really prevent those that have a more authoritarian approach to things from gaining traction. That we have, again, safeguards that protect us to a certain extent. Um, after watching what's happened in the United States over the past four years, I've come to realize that you can't take anything for granted. That even if you think there are good safeguards in place that can protect some of the very basic uh, liberty, some of the very basic considerations for a, a democracy, there are those that, you know, potentially it seems can make a lot of ground. Any, any thoughts about the Senate in that context, in its role as a safeguard to protect us against those that might have a little different approach or a little different view of the kind of power they assume when they take over a government, when they assume the role of being a governing party here in Canada? Um, you know, we're... Um we're small in the context of the question that you asked, I, I would say, um, but we're, and I, I wouldn't even say we're small and mighty, but we're not insignificant in championing the values of democracy and, and freedom and, and respect. Um, there are ways in which the Senate can do this. And I think that the, the people who are there are committed to that. They're committed to the preservation of democracy and, and attentive to ways in which it can be eroded in kind of small ways that sometimes um, problematic populism can generate. And I think the result is that you know, if, if you identify ideas that are safeguards for our democracy, individual senators would stand up for it. And I don't think anybody is out there, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say any of the 95 of us have, a, have anything other than this rich commitment to democracy on an individualized basis. And I, my own sense is that the institution is on that front made up of the kind of compilation of the values of the people who are there. So if we ended up appointing over a period of time, people who didn't really care much about democratic values and uh, the institutions of government in Canada, and maybe the concept that you know, we need to be uh, respectful of people who are uh, the most vulnerable in our society. If we if we abandon a lot of those views by the people that get put into the Senate, uh, we could have some trouble. But I think that's unlikely. And the amalgamation of that viewpoint right now causes senators to be on. You know, we're not the most sophisticated in knowing the the, the where you need to, to sort of build a firewall around protecting democracy, but uh, they certainly seem to be willing to stand up for it. And I think that would that's the, the best way that the Senate, senators individually and the Senate as a whole can assert its protection of those values. I can you know give speeches, you could give speeches probably better than me on these questions, but doing things at, at, at the margins that offer some degrees of protection are, are, I think the best answer, and it's the one place where the Senate can contribute. One of the things that I really like about um, moving to a less political Senate is that it seems to me it would increase its um, ability to protect those kind of values, to protect democracy in a sense, okay? So that in a tough situation, it really wasn't tied into the power, into the power of a party that might be trying to abuse, uh, you know, that kind of situation. And again, I look to the uh, to the United States and I see what's happening there, you know, and again, to me, some of this is almost unbelievable, but you almost need to prepare for it and make sure that you do have the firewalls in place ahead of time. Yeah, they, you know, they, I think they, um, if you, if you take the, the shape of the U.S. and the degree to which it's been a disappointment that senators who are associated with the 
the present president haven't stood up for richer principles of democracy and you know, respect for the courts, and you can make a long list of it. It's uh, uh, extremely disappointing. And this model where, to, to, you know, I think the prime minister probably resents some of the viewpoints in the, that some of the senators he appointed have had to say, but it's, it, uh, it, in, it, it provides a degree of enrichment, that independence. And, you know, to be honest, I, I wouldn't ever have been chosen, but I wouldn't have ever wanted to go to a Senate that was driven by those partisan values. I, I, you know, we're, you know, I'm a bit too Irish for my own good. I wouldn't like people telling me what to do, I think, for the one thing. But also, it, it's, uh, you know, you and I have had uh, terrific careers in government and you with SaskTel and I just thought I had something more useful to do. And when this idea opened up, I thought, you know, I think I can, I think I can help a bit. I, you know, I do say we are small and we are not mighty, but we're not insignificant or useless. So it's, uh, but you know, you and I, as I sit here talking, Ron, this is not on the topic, but you remember that those conversations of where some of your relatives were convinced that I was you. Well, I, I'm even more convinced of that. So there are on days when I can't make it to the Senate, if you're interested in sitting in, that would be great. Give me a call. I'll, uh, I'll double for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. I appreciate the call. Good to see you, Ron. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Uh, now, uh, Brent, we have a question from Ritva, and I'm just going to put it to you. Uh, how, this is quite an interesting question about how, how does the representation of provinces by the senators work within the, uh, the Senate? In other words, when we talk about Canadian Senate divisions, what does it entail in terms of the work that a particular Senate does for the division he or she represents? Does this role interact, intersect in any way with the role of elected uh, MPs? Um, it's, um, I mean, there's a theory that you're supposed to be another voice for the region. Um, I don't know that that's really been very much the case for very much of the history of the Senate because of the degree to which partisan politics have influenced the, the role of senators. Um, if you come back to that sort of first principles, um, I do think that there's an expectation independent of the members of parliament for senators to be able to, within their realm of influence and decision-making, advance or champion the interests that are relevant particularly to their province. I think the Quebec senators have the most uh, sensitivity to that in the country. Um, and But I do think it's something of value that senators can bring, and I like to think that I can. And I'm, I'm, um, I don't know who all is on the line, so I have to be a little careful of what I say here. But, um, you know, I, I think that uh, where I happen to sit myself as not uh, from any particular political party, because this is now the model of senators, but coming from a province where there are no elected members of parliament from the governing party on the one hand, and um, half of the existing senators were appointed by the conservatives, and I never quite know how, how well the dialogue goes in Ottawa, that I can be, I don't want to be a, at a kind of large P political level, I can be a bit more of a bridge between uh, provincial interests and Ottawa, including provincial government interests people of Saskatchewan, but also if, if there are ideas the government of Saskatchewan has that I can kind of just below the radar a champion in, in dialogue with the government of Canada, I think that's a role that senators can play. And I, you know, I, quite frankly, I used to be a deputy minister for a long time. Most of the work that I did was slightly below the radar and I got a good hang of that. And I think I have good relations with the people with whom those dialogues need to take place. So I, I think there is a way speaking for about myself, and I think for many of the other senators to contribute in the way that you're describing. So, so Brent, do you, do you find that senators have a reasonable access to uh, federal cabinet ministers? And, and I mean, in playing the role that you're talking about, you need to have that, you know, that, that kind of access, it, it, you know, and of course you're relatively recently appointed, but how, how do you see, uh, say, you and other senators connecting with the, the government of the day? Um, I think it's variable, Doug, and it's almost driven by uh, uh, the personalities of the senators themselves. Um, if you take, for example, um, Senator Beam, who worked in the federal government, he has a magical connection of linkages to existing cabinet ministers. If the conservatives came to power, he'd have the same uh, linkages with whoever gets appointed there. And 
my guess is that when Peter makes Peter Beam makes a, a request, he it's honored. He gets a meeting or a phone call, and they work things out. My and and some I think are probably uh, don't have much of that connection at all. In my case, um, I I have uh, two or three of the cabinet ministers are uh, you know friends or good acquaintances from a previous movie I mentioned. Uh, Minister Lametti, uh, Minister Anand was a law professor at the University of Toronto and actually did some work in the area of ethics. So she and I are well known to one another and uh, that would be true of Minister Wilkinson. Um, so there's a collection of senators that um, that have, I think, linkages with some cabinet ministers. And so if there's a file or an issue, um, they would get a ready ear. And, and I, I, at least within a limited group of the, of the cabinet, I think that's the case. I won't mention the issue, but I did have a, an issue or concern I thought I should share with the chief of staff to the prime minister. And, and uh, I had my assistant send a message and Chief Fomey back talked to me for half an hour. And I thought, holy cow, that's, I didn't know, this is uh, Ms. Telfer, I didn't know her at all. Um, she didn't know me, but uh, I think senators get, they, they get more respect from the political leadership, quite frankly, Doug, than I expected. And uh, that's heartening. I, I, I think one has to be a bit careful because the idea isn't, you know, suddenly turn yourself into a pawn of some cabinet minister and championing their view. That would, that would undermine the whole idea of independence, but it creates the possibility of good flows of information so that they can know where things stand and you can maybe make better decisions. So kind of linked to that, Brent, I mean, we've talked a little bit today about the advantages of, of the current system. Maybe you could, you know, if you're putting the argument on the other side, the, 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 the risks of the current system or the advantages of partisanship, like, you know, how, how do you, uh, how would you look at it from that perspective? Are there, are there things about the old system that had, had merit to it? Uh, and, uh, or, or there are, are there, are there things about the current system that, that, to give you a bit of pause? Um, I guess I would say about the, um, the, the previous system before 2014 is that there were certain efficiencies in the adoption of legislation that were advantageous. And uh, in some respects, um, uh, you know, Bob Hawkins point about, uh, do we run the risk of anarchy if the senators get too big for their, their boots kind of thing? So I think that there was a certain um, efficiency in that. The, the, these senators are not so much getting too big for their boots in the present regime, but they they have a they have a certain independent uh, uh, inclinations, and so we, they're not, we're not glued together. We tend to work together, but we're not unified in in some of the decision making, the way in which caucuses were, and the way caucuses were required to be in some circumstances. So I think that that's. Um, that's a factor that uh, that that is different. If you, if you want to see the cleaner, more efficient consideration of particularly of legislation, then I think the uh, the, the more partisan structure of the Senate would be uh, would would be liable to be for you. I also here I don't know very much because I wasn't there before, but um, there was a certain. Um, I would say understanding of the game, and here I'm borrowing a little bit of this from what I've observed in in uh, in, leg in legislatures, where the the opposition and the government kind of duke it out. Uh, here's my parallel: um, if you ever watch the Wiley e. Coyote uh, uh, cartoons and the Roadrunner cartoons on Bugs Bunny and whatever on Sunday nights, the the Roadrunner uh, was busy escaping the coyote for half an hour. They went at it like crazy. And then at five o'clock, they punched out and they went and had a beer together. And I think that kind of understanding the rules of the game, the format, well, you guys are the opposition. You're, this is what you're supposed to do. We're the government. This is what we're supposed to do. And, it, and we, we do that as best we can and as hard as we can during the day. And then we go and have a beer. I think there might have been I don't know this for sure about the Senate, there might've been the possibility of even though more partisanness, a certain degree of personal collegiality and you know, problem solving kind of off the record, so to speak. And that, that's uh, in the observations that I would make about the Senate right now, those, I mean, the COVID has interfered with this. So I, I would like to have gone and had coffee with some of the people who are in some of the other groups so we could talk about matters of common interest and that's pretty much been impossible. But it doesn't jump off the plate to me that there's this enormous kind of 
if not camaraderie, at least kind of uh, social warmth that cuts across the divisions right now. I need to learn more about that, but that's a bit my feeling. And, you know, what I observed mainly in the Saskatchewan legislature for a number of years is that people kind of downed tools at the end of the day and got along. And, and uh, strangely enough, more partisanship seems to have contributed to pretty decent collegiality. And I, I'm not, I haven't quite seen that yet. Just my personal take so far. Well, I'm uh, thanks, Brent. That's really interesting, uh, and and that you know it'll be interesting to sort of uh, reconnect uh, on this topic in a year and see sort of uh, yeah. you know how, how the things evolved, right? Um, though COVID's going to be around with us for for a while yet. Um, now, any other last questions that anybody has? Just put that out there. Well, Brent, I, I think uh, I, I join with Ron in saying, you know, I, I, I think you are an outstanding uh, 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 person in this role of, of senator. I think you'll, uh, you'll do us all proud from Saskatchewan, from those from Moose Jaw are particularly delighted. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I really thank you for taking the time. There's Ken. He's popped up and you know, there'll be a couple others that pop up as well. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the... the um, uh, you know, it's it's just uh, it's it's really important for us to understand where this uh, institution is going. It's it's not exactly a rebirth, but it's a, a a reformulation, and it's we really appreciate you taking the time to be able to to chat with us and uh, give give us your very significant perspective on this. So thank you so much. Let me just end by saying I, I'm quite genuine in my views that like we're, a lot of you are uh, students of this question have been for much longer. A time than than me about the role. Any of you have or questions or suggestions for these questions I'm still wrestling with, I would greatly welcome and I'm easily accessible on the Senate website. There's my email address there and I hope I uh, can be in some dialogue with you in the, going forward. Okay, folks, well, students, you've heard that. You've heard offer, so thank you very much, Brent, and to everybody else as well. And thanks to, to everybody that was on the line today. Karen, thank you for your great uh, assistance in making this happen today. Uh, Karen does a marvelous job. Uh, and we'll thank you all for and uh, allow you to slip away now. And uh, maybe, Brent, if you could hang on for a minute, we'll sure. just have a quick chat. Okay, sure. thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a nice day.